Hi, I'm happy you are here. Welcome back. Uh, this video is a revision of a previous one that had some issues and um, that I will try to address in this video. So for those of you that already seen that video, I've put uh, time marks to the various sections in the video in the description down below. So you will be able to move back and forward and directly to the uh, sections uh, that interest you more. Also, I've shared how I've made flat the ways of my homemade lathe. Flatness is of a paramount importance uh, for mechanical accuracy. And in this video, I will discuss the method that was proposed in 1840 uh, and uh, how you can achieve flat surfaces without any reference uh, out of nothing <laughs> with simple tools uh, uh, from scratch. A flat surface uh, it doesn't mean it is a nicely polished surface. Uh, for example, a window glass uh, is nicely polished but it is not flat or better. It is flat <laughs> but it is not flat uh, to the degree of accuracy required for mechanical accuracy. Flatness it is not the same as striteness. Uh, striteness uh, means uh, the uh, something that is straight uh, and flat but in just one uh, dimension uh, while a flat surface uh, as the name imply it is a surface so it has uh, two directions two dimensions flat surfaces are important references uh, to check against them uh, to uh, know if a part uh, is truly straight in both directions uh, x and y of its surface Theoretically, machine tools require straightness, not flatness. Uh, because, you know, for example, in a lathe, uh, if your tool wander, uh, your cone would be, wouldn't be a cone, your uh, cylinder wouldn't be a cylinder, and the same thing in a, in a milling machine, where uh, your x, y, z axis uh, uh, need to be straight, uh, otherwise your part uh, would be iffy. <laughs> um, but uh, because we live in a three-dimensional world, uh, uh, well, it has more than three dimensions, <laughs> but um, for our purposes, three di dimensions are enough. <laughs> so uh, we live uh, uh, in three dimensions, in a three-dimensional world, uh, and um, our surfaces have two dimensions so they have a surface uh, and therefore flatness uh, is again important how to make a flat surface without a flat surface isn't that a kind of chicken and egg causality dilemma which come first how did they made accurate parts refer to a flat before any true flat surface was ever made well they didn't it is known that flat surfaces were used as a reference before the 18th century, likely made by grinding two plates one against the other. But Joseph Whitworth, for the first time, formalized a method to attain true accurate flat surfaces, promoting the use of a die and a hand scraping described in a paper presented at the British Association in Glasgow on 1840. And uh, from his paper, we can understand uh, the limits the technology of the time had. He mentioned that because the lack of true flat surfaces that led to errors to the produced parts, uh, uh, that in turn was the cause of inefficiencies, tear and wear, loss of power, and poor results, uh, citing the valves of steam engines, the tables of printing presses, and the slides of all kinds. Actually, making precise, accurate parts is possible even with no high-precision tools. In fact, even simple rigs and tools could help us in making high-accurate parts. But besides the time required for the job, we would need a reference to match against it our parts to let us appreciate the error, gauge it and take the appropriate corrections step by step to achieve the required accuracy. And one of the key references is to have a flat surface. On it we can check the straightness and flatness. 
We can check if a cylinder is straight, round or not tapered and many other measurements. Digging the net, eventually I found something useful to try myself for the method. This method is awesome. You literally get three accurate flat surfaces out of nothing. You don't need a tool or machine that have a precision higher than the parts you start from. What you just need are simple, low-tech, not precise tools, just a scraper, a chisel or a file, a stone and die and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of elbow grease. I did this process myself to make the waves of my lathe and a spare flat ruler to use as reference plate. Why is it exciting to see the final result where the three plates are made together? It is also a very time-consuming and tedious work. Having a reference plane uh, is of a paramount importance for measuring and making precision parts that, uh, as I said in the introduction, are necessary to allow the production of the elaborated goods that are ubiquitous in our highly technological modern world. Before looking at the process, first let's lay down some definitions. Uh, this method uh, allows to get three surfaces that are flat not parallel, not nicely polished, not necessarily smooth or not rough, uh, not at a given size or other properties, but just flat, really did flat. Flatness is the evenness or the liveness of a surface and it is the deviation at which the reference plane, the plane we are gonna refer to for flatness, corresponds to an ideally perfect plane and flatness should be distinguished from straightness that is the deviation of just one dimension. So let's dive into the three plates method as described by Joseph Whitworth in his paper. First we start with the three uneven surfaces possibly already quite close to flatness to reduce the amount of work. I've chosen three flat cold roller bars. Quite well, uh, a cavity here. Uh, this is how I've made um, flat, but uh, more importantly, straight uh, the ways of my lathe. Uh, but this is not considered acceptable for some to make flat surfaces. But I will discuss this uh, in more in depth uh, later in the video. So let's move on. Quite, quite straight and already flat with a say better than half a millimeter. So let we name these pl three plates uh, A, B and C. At first step neither plate is known to be flat but we pick up the plate A to be used as a temporary hypothetical reference. We cover it with a die as even as possible and the plate B and C are compared against it scraping the heights enhanced by the color. This process is carried out only far enough to have the plate B and C to generally agree with plate A. Once this step is completed, B and C have picked up some of the errors from the plate A. So at the next step we compare the plate B and C one against the other so that the errors picked up are put in opposition the heights colored and scraped for an equal quantity on both plates, cancelling out the errors. To scrape on the on both the surfaces at the same time, this trick can be used. Uh, this part is already um, covered with the dye, and uh, this one is now rubbed against the. And here, you see here. The color indicates the height, and here the lack of color indicates the uh, the height on this on this side. So both the surfaces can be scraped uh, at the same time. Of course, this is true only during this step. After this second step is completed, even though none is really flat, uh, B and C are now flatter than A, and this is encouraging. <laughs> So at the next step we compare the plate A alternatively against the plate B and C trying to get uh, the, a result that is in the middle of the two. Also 
I have introduced a variant, so after some cycles the plate A is flipped around to detect the prominent spots quicker. At this point, A is presumed to be flatter than B and C, so as a fourth step, both the plates B and C are compared to A to make them to agree with A. This process is carried out so that the plate B and C match the plate A. When completed, the plates B and C will also have picked up all the errors of the plate A. So comparing them one against the other will put these errors in opposition, allowing to cancel them out by scraping the heights. So the fifth step is performed scraping both B and C as already seen in the previous step 2. After this fifth step is completed, both the plates B and C are flatter than A, but they could be somewhat concave or convex. So for the next sixth step, we, we use them as a new reference to make the plate A to match as close as possible both B and C. And here I have introduced another variant scraping of an equal quantity from both the plates at each pass. This cycle continues until all the three plates match together at a degree that is satisfactory for the required purpose. But starting from the fourth step, the whole cycle can be repeated over and over again to reach the desired degree of accuracy. Well, even though uh, Joseph Whitworth never mentioned it in his paper, there are people that uh, uh, argued that uh, you can't uh, use this method, uh, the three plates method, with uh, uh, surfaces that are not squared. Because uh, you need to rotate the, the, the parts uh, by 90 degrees to uh, detect uh, the peaks. Uh, as Robin Renzi uh, have shown very well in his video, uh, link in the description down below. Uh, let's see what Rinzet says. So, here's a plate. I have my A plate, I have my B plate on top. I lap, scrape, whatever, and I've got these perfectly matching. I remove B and I scrape C to match exactly. Then I combine C and B to check and see where we are and we're perfect okay these three plates must be flat because we have three mutually uh, evenly bearing surfaces so got to be flat right I don't think so Tim and that is because a absolute requirement of the three plate method is that you must be able to ro rotate your part 90 degrees when you're doing your checking and now you can see that when you rotate 90 degrees, all of a sudden you see what's going on and you've got big trouble. Well, uh, it seems that uh, you need a, a square surface uh, to uh, use the three plates method. But uh, someone have uh, mm, argued that that is not the case. You can a even use uh, um, uh, rectangular surfaces and that one is forced eddy. Uh, he said that uh, uh, you should not just rotate by 90 degrees, but you should rotate by more angles, uh, say, uh, say um, 20, 20, 30, 45, uh, and so on. Uh, this is because you have to randomize uh, where, uh, the, uh, where the peaks are and where the peaks are detected uh, one against the other uh, and this randomization um, should lead to a, a better flat surface. I don't take any stance on this statement because I, I, I'm not an expert uh, but I think that uh, on one hand uh, randomization means uh, the distribution uh, of the of the peaks, the detection of the peaks and for the re removal of the peaks and so uh, averaging down everything and therefore going toward flatness. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, the, that would cause to be harder to detect the peaks. Uh, and, uh, and that I'm not sure ab about the, the best result. Uh, however, since I've made this video 
particularly for those that are interested in making their ways at home, their uh, sleepways at, at home, and don't have access to uh, any bulky surface plate. Um, I, I thought to share my experience and uh, and my experience uh, with the, the ways of my of my lathe was that uh, uh, once uh, reached uh, the supposed flatness because checking in this way checking this way uh, checking uh, B against C and C against A and A against B etc. Let's think uh, that we are flat, gotta be flat. Uh, I thought to shift the, the bars uh, by a little amount, uh, say uh, 5 to 10 times the width, because the width of, of the bar are really small, uh, 12 millimeters, uh, even 100 millimeters over 860 millimeters uh, is nothing and there is no risk that the overhang weight here would increase the print of the dye of the color uh, because the this unbalance and uh, and uh, and therefore and this means however that uh, in this way what is supposed to be flat on one side if it is flat uh, would be uh, seen on the other side and if there is a lobe uh, a, a twist uh, that would be revealed because we have shifted the the point uh, of contacts and um, in this way uh, I was able to detect the the, the little amount of twist that uh, there was uh, that was in the in the bars and uh, to me it worked uh, and that was my experience. Uh, so I hope that this could be useful to everybody. But as I was said before, uh, I'm not an expert, so I invite you to leave your comments in the section below. And I invite you to share uh, and, uh, and like this video if you liked it. And if you would like to know when a new video is uploaded, uh, consider to subscribe and click the bell icon. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.